Welcome back, my name is Ho Mai, and in this video we are going to be discussing the rule of the octave. In particular, the rule of the octave in its major variation. So the rule of the octave is a historical method that um, composers and musicians used to teach fundamental principles of harmonic leading and harmonic progressions. So to understand how this was developed, we have to understand one key relationship, and that is the relationship of dominant and tonic. So what that refers to is in every given in any given scale, let's say for a C major for example, okay, we have a tonic. That's the first scale degree. And when you build a triad or a larger chord above that, that becomes the tonic chord, in this case C major, the one chord. And if we go to the fifth, Okay, that's one, two, three, four, five. A fifth above the tonic is G. We build a chord that becomes the dominant chord. And this is important because dominant chords always want to resolve a fifth down. Okay, so this is the dominant tonic relationship. Dominants always want to resolve the tonic, five to one. However, we can take this further because every chord has its own five. For example, if you take D, if we go up a fifth, that would be A. So if we have D, in the key of C major, that'd be D minor. The A chord would be A minor. Okay, so you can make this major by making it a major chord by um, adding the C sharp. So this is this is really important to note here. So if you do not have a clear understanding of dominant relationships, then this video is going to be a bit on the advanced side. But I'm assuming that you do understand dominant relationships because that's pivotal to understand the logic behind these progressions, because it's rather simple when you do understand it. So let's take a look at the typical roll of the octave. We're looking right here. Okay, I'm gonna play through it so you can hear what it sounds like. So notice, you have your C major scale ascending. Here's the descending portion. So we're not going to worry about the voicing. We just want to understand how the chords were chosen and why they were chosen. Is this the only way you can harmonize the scale? No, of course not. But this is a very basic method utilizing dominant relationships. So let's take a look at this. We are given a figured bass in the bottom. So again, if you don't understand figured bass, then this we're not going to cover that in this video. There will be another video made in the future that covers that. So I'm going to make all these chords different colors. This is a one chord. Any C major chord is a one chord. Here's a one chord. You have another one chord over here. Your next one chord occurs here. A one chord over here. You have a one chord over here. And a one chord over here. Okay, let's highlight those one chords. So we'll make the one chords blue. Okay. Now notice the notes of the one chord in the bass in this case the scale. You have C, E, and C. Well, C is obvious because that's a root of a one chord. E is the third of it, okay? So it's also very logical because here's the reality. There are, the, of the chords that in C major that contain an E, you really only have three possibilities when it deals with triads. It can be an E minor chord, which is a three chord, a median chord. It could be the one chord, and it could be the sixth chord, the submediate chord. Those are your three possibilities, okay? Because the E can be either the root, the third, or the fifth. So in this case, to keep it very simple, we want to use the one chord as much as possible whilst keeping this uh, somewhat interesting sounding. All right, so then, this is just a game of destinations, all right? So the next thing we care about is the five chord. The five chord, which is the dominant, very, very strong tendencies here. So when the five, in this case G, is in the root position, that would be the fifth note of the scale, the logical thing would be, oops, that's the wrong one, to make it a five chord. And if we take a look, that's exactly what happened. This is a five chord, and this is a five chord. 
Okay, very logical. Five quarter when you get to that G. Now, the next thing to think about is where does five want to go? Well, five wants to go to one. Five wants to go to one because five wants to resolve to one. Dominant to tonic or dominant tonic. Many ways you can voice this. Okay. So knowing this information, we can precede every one chord with a five chord. So let's take a look at this one chord here. All right. Can we precede it with a five chord? Sure we can. That D is the fifth of the chord. Right? Because here's the five chord. D is the fifth. So let's just voice this such that we have a 5-7 resolving to the 1-6. You see how that works? So uh, it's just 1-5-1 one, one to open up with. And the reason it's done this way is because it's super simple. 5 wants to resolve to 1. Let's take a look at the next 1 chord over here. Okay? Let's see what happens here. Can we precede it with a 5 chord? Well, the, what's the note? It's a B. Is B in a 5 chord? Yes, it's the third of the chord. So, of course, we can precede this with a 5 chord. So, we make this a 5 6 5, which is just a 5 7 in first inversion, where the third of the chord, the leading tone, is in the bass position. Sounds like this and resolves to 1. So, already we have many of the notes of the scale covered D to E, B to C, and G, and the lower C. Let's take a look at the descending portion. Okay, the very, uh, let's go over here, just go in order. Can we turn this chord into a five chord? It has an F in the bass. Well, let's think about this. Well, F is not the root, it's not the third, it's not the fifth, but guess what? It is the seventh of the five chords. So absolutely, we can make this also a five chord. Five, four, two, which is simply third inversion, five, seven, which leads to the one, sounds like this. So it's five, five, seven, one. It's basically what we have, five, five, four, two, one. So see how this is really going by simplest means of harmonization. We're not complicating this at all. This is literally, let's do dominant and tonic as much as we can, right? Even if that means we have two dominants in a row, which is exactly what happens in this instance right over here. You've got two dominants that lead to the tonic. So let's look at the final tonic. It's preceded by D. We've, we've already established D is the fifth of a five chord. So yes, we can make this a five chord. Boom. Look at that. All right. So now we've covered everything except for four chords. Okay. We've covered everything except for four chords. And of course, we're going to be using the five and the one as much as possible. We've already established all the one chords. We've gotten covered almost all of the five chords. So let's take a look at this chord, this mystery chord right over here. Hmm. We have an F. We could make it a 5, but we're not going to 1 yet. We're going to go to A. You see that? Uh, we know that we have a destination here. We're going to go to this A chord. Right? And so we're really going to the G. Well, here's a little trick. What's the 5 of G? The 5 of G is D. The D is the 2 chord, D minor 2 chord. Is the F in D minor? Yes, it is. So for this chord here, we're actually going to use a 2 chord. And we're voicing it as a two, minor 2, 6, 5, which is a 2, 7, a minor 2, 7 chord, D minor 7. Okay, Which works because guess what? 2 is leads leads to five it wants to go to five in this case we're leading up see how that works dominant relationships another way of thinking of this chord is that this two is the five of five so in a way you can think of this as five of five really really simple Let's take a look at that next mystery chord, the one that, where the basis note is an A. It's sandwiched between two five chords. Okay, This 
takes us to a very common relationship, the 1-4-5-1 progression, which is a very common cadence, 1-4-5-1. So we know we're going from 4 to 5, or the A to the B. Uh, we can absolutely insert a 5 chord right there. So I'll do this. I'll use, um, I'm running out of colors here. I'll use blue, even though it doesn't match my scheme. Just a 4 chord. That's all that is, just a 4 chord. 4, 5, 1. Sounds good. That's our ascending coercion. That's how it's constructed, based on dominant relationships. Now let's do the descending portion. We've covered everything, but we have two chords to, to finalize. If we look at the second chord, it's a B. The most logical is a five chord. Sure, let's do a five chord, no problem. That works. So see how many five chords we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many one chords do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, really five. So 12 of our chords are comprising just the five and the one. We have one two chord, one four chord. And there's one more chord to decide on here, okay? So let's take a look here. It's an A. It's five sandwiched between five. We're leading to five again, not leading to one, leading to five. So the A happens to be the fifth of the two chord. So we can use the two chord again. But to get a little fancy, instead of using the diatonic version of the two, we're actually going to use a 2-7, which is the 5-7 of 5, by changing the third of the chord, F natural to F sharp. There you have it. Why? Because F sharp as the leading tone we wants to resolve up to G, it gives you a stronger sense. And that is the rule of the octave in the major form. So here's the whole thing again. One chord, five seven in second inversion, one in first inversion. So the two chord in first inversion, which wants to lead to five, this is the dominant of five, which then takes us to the four chord in first inversion, and then to the five chord, the five seven in first inversion, which leads to one chord. Descending to the five chord in first inversion, then we're gonna go to the two seven dominant form which is the 5 of 5, which resolved to 5, the 5, 7 in 3rd inversion, which then leads to the 1 chord in 1st inversion, then to the 5 chord again in 2nd inversion, and finally to the 1 chord. So hopefully this was helpful to understand um, basically how the rule of the octave was constructed. It is literally probably the most basic way you can harmonize this. We could go a lot more fancy. We can use other types of relationships besides the dominant relationship. Um, but the whole point of this exercise is to give uh, musicians a very fundamental understanding of how to lead from one note to another and how to harmonize notes within a scale. Obviously, this can be ap applied to any major scale. In the minor form, we have some variations, and we can take a look at that later. Um, but for now, uh, that's all I have for you today, and I will see you in the next video. Take care.